get started? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I want to first thank uh, Professor Samten and, and Professor Shishir Roy and Professor Madhukana for giving me an opportunity to speak before you. So today, I'll be speaking a bit on beauty and recursion in the Indic thinking. I'm from uh, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. My name is Gopinath. I, I'm from computer science, so my thinking is colored by computation. <laughs> okay? So I hope you will forgive me in case I uh, see everything in terms of computation. Okay. So this is, uh, I thought I would start with a few pictures. I, I think this, uh, you can see this, uh, I, I happened to look at some YouTube and uh, one music that, uh, Nikhil Benerji's music, uh, uh, Sitar, and they were showing some pictures on that. I found it very striking. You can see that uh, uh, this is a common motif in uh, Indian thinking. Okay. You'll see a tree going from top to bottom. It's a computer science tree, which goes root at the top. And of course, there's another tree which goes from bottom to top. And you'll see symmetry. That tree is not really strictly geometric uh, symmetry. It's a slightly uh, different type of symmetry. And it is a very colorful Indian uh, way of thinking about it, I would say. Okay. I thought I'll just start showing some few examples first. And this is an example from a book called The Night Life of Trees, written by some uh, uh, tribal artists from Jharkhand. And uh, they said something interesting. I just took a picture of that uh, from that book. They talk about a people tree. It's so perfect that seen against the sky, it seems to have the same shape as its own leaf. The detail is the same as the whole. Again, Professor Shishirai was talking about fractals. This is, an, in, this is a, uh, let us say, a tribal perspective or Indic perspective deep down somewhere. Okay. Again, in the same book, you'll see some interesting pictures. The snakes on the earth. Of course, it's a very colorful way of thinking. The earth is held in the coils of the snake goddess, and the roots of the trees coil around the earth too. The earth and the snake are the same thing. In a sense, you know, the thinking is colored with uh, certain images, okay? And uh, of uh, nature itself, okay? So there's a certain deep uh, interconnection between thinking and nature. And again, this also carries on to in many other areas. For example, many people find it very odd that in Indian thinking, spiders are very important. Okay? And for example, the, the fact that uh, the spider's web right, emerges from a web, and the web itself again goes back into the spider. Okay? It's a certain interesting idea. Okay? So, uh, and again, the weaver, basically the Brahman, is the material as well as efficient cause of the world. It is both the weaver and the warp and woof across which all phenomenal existence move on. Again, this is seen in many, many other places. For example, in a can uh, Canada, there is a Virish I was. They talk about, for example, shrouding himself in the self spun yarn, which he finally swallows himself. Again, he's talking about a spider. Okay. Again, he's a Tamilian poet. He again talks about ingesting, emanating, emanating from the self. Again, the spider concept. So again, I thought, uh, let me take a step backwards and let me go to the slightly more uh, modern world. If you look at, uh, there was one very dis distinguished uh, uh, scientist, physicist, mathematician, one Nyman, and uh, let's try to understand what he was thinking about, okay? I think uh, in computer science, we have a notion of what is called a universal Turing machine. That is, if there is a computation, it can always be simulated by a universal Turing machine. That is, any computation that is computable can be simulated by a universal Turing machine. So this was proved by Turing in uh, 1936, approximately. And uh, 191, being the scientist, mathematician, physicist he was, he wanted to generalize it and understand what is there, for example, if I want to think about self-producing automata. Can I use this intuition of a universal Turing machine and think on similar lines? Okay? And so he basically decided, suppose there is a universal Turing machine exists, he says, let us posit that a universal construction machine also exists. Okay? So basically, what does this construction machine do? Given a suitable description of the I of M instructions, you might say I can be thought of an instruction. Instructions for constructing the automaton, it constructs a copy of M. Again, think of a cell, you know, you have a cell and it creates another cell. Okay? So in a sense, there has to be some description of that cell. Okay? So in a sense, you can represent it mathematically as this is a universal construction machine. Given the description, it returns the, uh, the object. Okay? Okay? But interestingly, it does not reproduce the instructions itself. In a sense, you know, when you have some machine which makes a computer, 
it makes a computer but it's not the uh, instructions which uh, are required to make that machines which makes a computer okay you can think think of it as a recursive way of uh, what is needed really to make it a self reproducing system okay so in a sense if you have this you have make this assumption that this is a universal construction machine you produce you give it some <coughs> description of what has to be produced and it produces that machine but it doesn't uh, really replicate itself completely because the uh, machinery required to produce itself is not there okay so again uh, in computer science what often of often one of the things they do in mathematics and computer science is you can feed something to itself okay and that's what you can do here for example suppose i take the instructions for that universal construction machine the instructions you feed it to that construction machine itself what happens again you will find that it returns the machine but no instructions how to make itself okay so there is a certain lacuna okay in a sense okay so again this is something like you know people say in neuroscience that uh, of course this is uh, there is there is some controversy here because of plasticity of the human brain etc but there has been for some time a belief that a neuronal cell when it begins the beginning it gets fixed for life and it doesn't again regenerate okay there is some such uh, strong opinion okay so in a sense what we are talking about this kind of machines is creation of a neuronal cell which is fixed at birth but it does not really is capable of further replication a self reproducing aspect of it so in a sense so uh, if you want really what neumann was thinking was is there a way in which i can do something better than this one okay because if i have a universal construction machine give it that instructions it's able to produce the object to desire but it's not able to replicate the ecosystem by which it can reproduce itself okay that ecosystem is missing so in a sense what neumann thought was let us say that in in addition to this uh, ifu the instructions i add something additional which essentially creates the ecosystem in some sense let's say i'm able to do this but it turns out that if you think about it if you apply this particular instructions along with the ecosystem instructions along with it to give it to that you it produces u plus ui but not this whole system itself finally you know if it has to be reproduce, reproducing it has to be some kind of fixed point it has to reproduce the whole ecosystem also and it is not able to do that okay so in a sense uh, what happens is that uh, you cannot really augment the system that way it doesn't really work okay so finally uh, uh, one time i thought the way to do it is by actually postulating a few other machines for example there is a copy machine and there's a loading machine okay and then you can construct a, a composite machine which takes uh, instructions that of the whole composite system creates a copy loads it onto the universal construction machine and out comes the actual construction machine and this it turns out is a complete system okay the self reproduction and actually it, it uh, one i mean showed that you need about 63 states and other kinds of things okay he uh, proved all these things okay so now what i'm trying to show is that there is certain uh, you cannot have a totally unitary system just uh, uh, just a single conceptual idea and that reproduces itself it actually requires auxiliary systems and when they put them together actually you find that there is a complete self reproduction system and surprisingly this is uh, this idea is there also in uh, indic thinking when i mean indic thinking i'm talking about the hindu way of thinking the buddhist way of thinking the jaina way of thinking the, that is all the uh, thinking that has come from this country okay. and this is an example of that you can see this is hampi you can uh, this always follows a mystifying to me this is of course i think all of you know this vishnu and out comes some naval uh, brahma and of course you uh, lakshmi etc are there i always find it mystifying you can't explain it okay it is so mind boggling and there is also he is uh, sleeping in a on a serpent right on the ocean okay it's a totally uh, what i might call it non rational uh, something which you can't really digest okay so i was thinking what is the kind of, let me just see what neumann said and is there a connection between these two things hmm? yeah i'm sorry how can you say it is non rational no because i am not able to explain it okay Okay. 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 I think I'll, I'll try to. Uh, okay. So again, this is uh, uh, the same thing in a uh, Devgar, which is uh, very nearby. It's about 100 miles. I think about a few hundred kilometers from here. And this is also the same expression. You can see this is uh, one of the oldest temples. Okay. Yeah. This is one of the oldest temples in uh, India, about uh, at least 1500 or more years old. Okay. And this also you can see the same thing. And I just wanted to mention that this is the conceptualization of this. Uh, 
interesting idea. And I'm, what is interesting to me is that you can see the germ of the thinking that one man actually had it here. Basically because you can see, if you try to see what people have said, okay, you'll see that uh, the words that, that are used itself has some uh, potency here. For example, Sesha is uh, the snake, and Sesha actually in Sanskrit means what is remaining. Okay? And uh, what is remaining, you'll see that uh, when I look at that, I mentioned instructions, right? These instructions had to be loaded onto a machine. Okay? And then once you load onto the machine, then actually that uh, self reproduction happens. Okay? I showed you that thing. Right? And here is a case where you can see that the Brahma is the creator, but he needs auxiliary machines. And that is where the Vishnu comes into picture. The Vishnu is basically that all pervading. Because again, the name itself mentions Vishnu is basically means pervasion. And it is time pervasion and space pervasion. Okay, both the things are there. Okay? And these two things together has to be present. And every kalpa or every uh, so many years, there's destruction. But the remnant of the previous eras somehow remain. The instructions remain. And they have to be again loaded. And then finally, once it is willed, then Brahma comes into the picture and starts creating it. I think it is sort of similar to that. I mentioned the loading and the uh, coffee machines. They are sort of subsumed by the Vishnu and the snake, the Sesha part of it. And then the Brahma part is actually that universal construction machine. So I am just uh, trying to uh, make sense of, uh, because this is a deep, uh, let us say, if you go to Kerala, for example, another Padmanabha temple, you'll see the same thing. You'll see it everywhere. It's a very, very complicated and uh, at least it's very not easy to understand what people are trying to say. And the best I can think of as a, coming from computer science is some element of this one. But this is like cosmic memory? Yeah, something of that kind. That's why it's called Shesha. Okay? That's why it is, for example, one commentator says the potent remainder of the destroyed universe is embodied in the Shesha. And that's just called the instructions that are sitting there, which has to be loaded onto the universal construction, which is the Brahma. Okay? Because Brahma is the thing which is the creator. Bru. Bru means to create. Okay? So again, the, all the words, for example, also are connected with all these things. Again, this, uh, I, think, I think I'll skip in terms of time, I'll not go through this one. And again, this is another conception. Again, if you look at Kajuraho, this is another conception of uh, this uh, uh, creative impulse that Ardhana Arishwari. Okay? It's, uh, okay, it's an interesting idea. Okay? Again, I don't want to go too much into I think all of you. Okay? Again, this is that, again, Kajuraho, that uh, uh, an ex extreme uh, exuberance of this creative aspect. Again, it seems what I can say is that from a computer science perspective or a mathematics perspective, there are a lot of symbolisms and there is a representation aspects. Once you have symbolism and representation, recursion is one aspect of what we think about. Okay? And basically, why do you mean a recursion? Because the world is huge, the world is small. How do I go from here, my level, at my level, how do I go to the, the huge, how do I go to the small? And the only way I can do it is through iteration or recursion. That is, in a sense, I can create some structures by which I can jump from this small, wherever I am, to this huge thing or that very small thing. Okay, that the only way I can do it is computationally as a form by which I can iterate or I can recurse. Okay, this is the only way, at least as a computer scientist, I can understand it. So I'm going to develop this particular idea. Okay? So in a sense, you have this notion of the micron macro. Again, uh, Professor Madhukana talked about the, uh, basically the micro and the macro, and I think even uh, uh, others also have spoken about it. And uh, so basically, uh, you can also expand it by micro, meso, and macro. That is our level, the micro level, and the macro level. And again, you'll see that in our Indian tradition, Indic tradition, you'll see that the human, temple, city, or universe, various kinds of models are present. Okay? And this is uh, very common uh, in uh, uh, many areas. I think I just will briefly mention some quickly. The, in astronomy, you'll find it. In temples, also, you'll find it. And the combined, also, you'll find it. For example, in Shulba Shustras, there's something called Dakshinag Dakshinagni, which is basically the winter solstice. is actually uh, basically the location of this what Agni. Three this, uh, this the common era. C stands for common era. So okay. Yeah, that means 300, uh, that means uh, 0, 100, 200, 300, okay? Often called AD, okay? It's a common era is what is normally nowadays used, okay? okay. So basically, there are Gatikalayas where basically the uh, marking sunrise and sunset at equinoxes and salt spaces, basically some structures are there. Similarly, you'll find in Mantapas and Shavan Belgola, you'll find it in Sringeri, Vidya Shankara, the temple. 
you'll find that 12 rashis are marked. So when the rising sun comes in, it actually certain glows. You'll find that that particular sunlight illuminates it. Okay, and uh, you'll see in Bangalore also there is a Gavi Ganga the rest for a temple. You'll see similar structures. Okay, and uh, you'll see it very strikingly in the case of Angkor Wat. You'll see that uh, at equinox, you'll see that particular spires are actually illuminates. Uh, okay? Some people have taken pictures of at equinox like that. Okay, similarly that. You'll see it here. Okay, you can see all this, uh, and they are precisely constructed. Okay, because people have looked at the geography of the place, figured out exactly when the equinox happen, and they've done it. Okay. And that too, you can, if you look at Angkor Wat, you'll find some amazing things. If you look at the uh, the let us say the structure of the whole com uh, complex, you'll find that if you take the uh, the west to east or the north to south, if you add them, it turns out to be. 365, you know, the 365 days, right? That is in units of some unit called heart. Okay. <laughs> Similarly, if you look at uh, the, if you measure all these distances, they are actually corresponding to some of the yuga periods. For example, from uh, uh, this distance from A to, uh, for example, A to F, okay, it is basically Krita Yuga in, 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 proportionally, and Kali Yuga is from B to C, and then Dvapara Yuga D to E. Okay, etc. Basically, it's all proportional. And if you measure the things, you'll find that they are in that proportion. Okay? So in a sense, what's happening is that the microcosm, the universe is represented in a meso scale at the temple level in these kind of models. Okay? Again, if you again look at uh, uh, Angkor Wat, you'll find that there are various alignments, and these alignments are actually connected with astronomical significance. That on particular days, you'll find that the sun comes this way, etc. And they actually measured it systematically, and they have something like 22 alignments that can be used to, uh, let us say, understand various observations of sun and moon. Okay. Again, Professor Rana Singh has, uh, I'm thinking, if, I'm pretty sure he's here. Okay. Okay. And he has also studied extensively. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything more on the subject. Okay. 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 And uh, I think uh, in terms of recursion in space and time, I think uh, also, uh, I think Kak has made, Subhash Kak has made some very interesting observations. That if you look at it, the sun and the moon are approximately 108 times their respective diameters from the Earth, and that explains the number 108 and 1008. All those things are very, very prominent in Indian thinking, because precisely because the angular, uh, the angular uh, elevation of the sun and the moon both are about uh, the same, and uh, that happens to be connected with that number 108. Okay, it's a very sacred number in Indian uh, thinking. Okay, and that's basically the. In a sense, what Subhas Kak is saying is that homologies at many levels are the basis of the idea of recursion or repetition of scale and time. Okay. Okay, I think I don't have time to go through this, but basically I think I just want to mention that, that Indrajala is basically, uh, I think, a notion. It's there in the Vedic uh, thinking, in, uh, 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 also, also in Buddhist thinking also it is there. And basically that at each node of the net where threads cross, there is a gem that mirrors all the other gems in the net. Okay? And reflection of each gem in every other one represents the idea that each point of reality is defined by the rest of the universe. So there are all kinds of recursive concepts. Okay? Each depends on everything else in some sense. Okay? Again, this is uh, Sri Rangam temple. Okay? And so you can see it also in many other areas. For example, in uh, uh, dance forms, Bhartha, uh, in Bhartha, for example, in his Nati Shastra, he talks about, for example, uh, Bartha, he say, he, this is basically Kapila Bhatsa is talking about it. Bartha brings together into one fold the essential the speculative thought, particularly the complex system of establishing correspondence between the limbs and organs of the human body, the senses and aspects of the cosmos, as well as the methodology of the Brahmanas with the earth, space, time are consecrated to so suggest a cosmic God. Again, this was talked about by Professor Madhuk, uh, Madhukana also. Okay? Okay? And uh, basically, in some sense, the dance form is constructed in some space and time. Okay? And uh, I just want to show some diagrams here. Uh, okay? You'll see all these uh, geometrical forms when you're actually, uh, uh, okay? again, th basically, this is, that, this is basically that what is called uh, Ardhamandali, or Aramandi, okay, of uh, Bharatanatyam. Okay? Hmm? And that's what is interesting is that uh, she makes a comment that uh, the body assumes postures of selling recalling yantras, all contained in the space of a circular square. And not only that, Bharatanatyam is a series of triangles in space, whereas Kathakali is a square. Manipuri, a spiral, or an interpoint spiral, serpent. In Kathak, an axis. On axis, you actually rotate, and various uh, you know, angular motions are made. 
and what is this a tribanga like a tribanga okay basically in a sense what's happening is the whole dance forms are constructed of uh, various kinds of interesting shapes and uh, uh, you will see that uh, uh, bharatanatyam especially with the, uh, the aramandi and etc right is a lot of triangles uh, the instruction one after another again if you think a bit more um, the rasa theory also has some very fascinating ideas here okay again uh, it turns out there are some very seminal ideas like bhava and rasa there's a two level model okay and uh, it talks about uh, basically bhavas are the states being portrayed let's for simplicity i'll just mention it this way bhavas are the states of being portrayed by the actors and rasas are the ones experienced by the members by the audience okay and so there are interesting ideas about bhava rasa and sthayi bhava that which is recurrent okay unless it's recurrent it really cannot you cannot really get that rasa okay and uh, and then there is some notion of what is called sadharinikarana basically generalization that is uh, basically when you see this particular type of situation you want to generalize it to uh, for example being in love for example right or being angry okay you generalize it okay and this powerful ideas have been constructed by uh, bharata and actually uh, lollata and uh, various other uh, uh, bhatanayaka etc okay so uh, what is interesting for me is that there is a two level model here okay that is uh, rasa as one idea and then there is a bhava as an idea and this bhava sir basically the what you might call the the lower level atomic units out of which you construct the rasa okay and uh, what is interesting to me is that if you think about current neuroscience etc various people are also thinking of uh, this kind of models i just mentioned one theory which i found it very fine interesting okay which is uh, basically that bhava sir akin to information structures and rasa is a information message okay and uh, this is what is there in uh, there is one roger arford he is trying to understand what is called qualia okay and uh, he basically says that qualia are, are created through neurobiological mechanisms of reentrant feedback in cortical systems and if you think about our sthayi bhavas what is sthayi bhavas those bhavas that are recurrent okay only when they are recurrent then actually you find that there is a certain fixity and that fixity gives you that essence of rasa okay so uh i think this is an interesting uh, model and uh, basically i just uh, uh, offered suggests that information in general is of two types information structure information message information structures are defined by physical basic vehicles structural biological patterns encoding information that encoding information is information message a source describing what information is so there are two different this is a two level model okay again you will see that in rasa theory also you have the two model model the bhavas which is basically the substrate on which you construct the rasa actually okay and this is to be conveyed by the actor to the recipient okay so this is what is the interesting two level model is okay again you think about it modification information structure changes the meaning of the information message but the message itself cannot be directly altered you have to change the substrate to actually get a thing you cannot directly go and change the message itself there's some interesting ideas here i think uh, so i think i just want to quickly uh, summarize what i've done so far basically there is a deeply embedded notion of recursion in multiple layers inquiry and unique thinking okay and again the question is where does it come from and this is what i'm trying to i'm not sure i have much time but i just will try to summarize it quickly okay and basically this comes from i think this basic idea of composition recursion iteration okay and this is something in computer science we basically say that we have to decide on how to represent and manipulate knowledge inference and deduction again this is a very strong uh, area for indic thinking of course uh, both the uh, vedic thinking buddhist thinking jainist thinking there's a lot of emphasis on these aspects okay and so by because of this emphasis on these aspects okay there has been a lot of tradition of uh, systematic inquiry in all these areas and that's why recursion all those things are also important again you can see a very quick example of this this is a uh, what is called a, in computer science we call it a syntax diagram but this is actually the grammar of panini written in a uh, the diagrammatic fashion basically this is uh, it tells you that various structures panini structures can be got by various systematic uh, let us say elaborations of the same thing for example you can start with a padi padikam add a sub to it you get a subanta then you add this part again you can go back and recurse it you can iterate recurse go back and forth construct bigger and bigger and bigger examples okay so in a sense it gives you an idea about how to construct very large things coming from atomic units okay and this is a very what is a sustained model that's there in panini for example and uh, and that is where the composition iteration recursion all these ideas are very much part of the indian tradition 
and that's why it's no wonder that in indian uh, thinking the number system actually uh, flowered uh, the most systematically and uh, that's why for example multiplication and division algorithms were developed much earlier in india than anywhere else because if you look at roman numerals it's almost impossible to do multiplication and division you need a phd to be able to do multiplication and division in roman numerals like it's almost that difficult okay and you'll find that this numerical iteration is a very com com common idea you'll find it in taittiriya upanishad you'll find it in buddhist thinking for example in alita vissara for example there is large very large numbers are discussed in jaina for example also you'll see very very large numbers and uh, what is interesting is that not only is there iteration at uh, number level you'll also find uh, iteration on algebraic forms on uh, also on uh, composition algebraic forms okay and convergent series all these things are also there okay i mean not sure have time to go through some of these things but uh, i just uh, uh, mention some of these things quickly okay again this is an example of uh, counting in taittiriya upanishad you start with one manishra this is the happiness levels starting from 100 10 to the power of 4 10 to the power of 6 10 to the power of 18 and it stops at 10 to the power of 20 this is exactly about uh, 2 to the power of 64 somewhere in between okay. you'll see it in jainas also they have a uh, they want to find out how to really come with extremely huge numbers and uh, i'm coming with i uh, came up with some notation basically uh, they they, have, they call it what is called vargita samvargita and basically uh, what is this this suppose there's a number x if you raise it to itself let me call it x prime okay so for example 2 prime will be 2 to the power of 2 that's 4 the question is suppose i keep doing recursively again this iteration recursion the whole idea again coming okay if you do this you'll get this number the third time itself you get a huge number it actually comes out to 678 and then they say what happens if you do the fourth time what happens if you do the fifth time these things are unbelievably huge asamkhyata so huge that you can't think of it okay again jainas are thinking about all these things you can ask yourself why are these people thinking about all these things it is because we have this macro and the micro and we are somewhere stuck in between we want to go and reach that thing how do we do it okay so we are thinking about all these amazing ways of thinking about okay how to bridge this gap okay again in a sense what we can say is that it's a computational perspective on inquiry again in mathematics and astronomy it's very obvious but you'll find this there in generative linguistics in music i already alluded to it architecture poetry prasathi etc okay so i'll just try to wrap up quickly you have 3 mi minutes okay 3 minutes is tough okay we'll see okay. so it turns out that uh, in uh, indic thinking there is a uh, uh, computation as an inquiry is a very powerful model and uh, what is called druk ganikaitya druk is the observation ganita is computation how to make the computation and uh, uh, let us observation go together and for example baskara this in Karn from karnataka okay about this time he talks about for example grantha uddesha okay and he says that it is druk ganikaitya okay he's saying that i'm writing this book so that observation and uh, let us say calculation can go together okay again he's talking about astronomy and i think uh, uh, professor uh, rudam narsimha in uh, nias where professor sishna also is from he has uh, discussed this idea what is called computational positivism and basically that uh, computation observation agreement constitute only form of valid knowledge and this is a particular perspective from indic uh, thinking and i think this is what is basically what is the substratum on which all our other ideas what i earlier alluded to in the beginning okay for example arabatiam it's a seen as a collection of 50 plus algorithms he doesn't come with axioms he starts with the constants first and then he starts with various uh, uh, ingenious uh, models of expressing numbers and then he talks about physical concepts and then he tries to there is no axiomatic development it's more about observation and how to explain the observation using uh, certain uh, how to explain certain observation through certain other simpler observations made for example calculate like measurements So in essence, what you can say, Arabati M does is provide short and effective methods of calculation rather than a basic model from which everything can be deduced. This is not an axiomatic model. Okay, so essentially describes algorithmic or computational astronomy. Okay, I think <coughs> I, I think uh, just wanted to mention that this particular algorithmic thinking is very widespread in India, and uh, we have a lot of interesting examples of deep algorithms, like for example, Chakravala. Okay, or for example. Uh, Uh, I'll just show this example of backtracking algorithm. This is an example of a poem. If uh, you read it this way, you get one poem. Or if you do it, the horse 
way of jumping okay for example sti ta sa okay you jump like this basically that horse jumping okay that's uh, in chess right you have this uh, actually it turns out every place you jump you will find that there is a poem or that comes out okay so you can put on all the characters so this is what is called a chitra kavya okay and this it turns out if in computer science if you want to discover the structures you need something called backtracking algorithms and these kind of algorithms were i don't know whether implicitly known or they were exhaustively enumerated we don't know but as early as uh, like 1000 ad people are talking about it because this one vedanta deshikan in one of his books he has got many examples of this okay so this uh, vedanta deshikan's book i okay, i'll give details about it okay. again multiplication it looks like a turing machine i'm sorry i don't have time to go through it okay so again uh, if you look at uh, our tradition you will find that there's a lot of iteration and uh, recursion going on in all over the place and uh, you'll see that uh, square root for example you'll see these examples this is geometric this is uh, using what's called chakravala it turns out to be a iterative solution i don't have time to go through it but uh, this turns out to be a iterative uh, solution and uh, this is an example of a bakshali manuscript this is about uh, recently dated to about 200 uh, ad okay and this one is basically uh, what is nowadays called newton raphson method actually it turns out that it's uh, actually not a simple newton raphson it's iterated newton raphson okay again there is an element of, i can ask you so like 200 ad why are people doing this new, iterated uh, newton raphson what is interesting it is there i don't have an explanation for it but it is there and it's extremely accurate okay this is that uh, uh, manuscript you see that numbers this actually this number is same as this number and you'll see this 507 you can see th this 3 here 3 3 3 exactly okay and this number huge numbers because they didn't have decimal numbers that only rational numbers and they're actually computing they're actually trying to solve this equation okay and it turns out uh, they are using newton raphson they come with an initial approximation and then they are iterating over it as they're iterating over the because they don't have decimal numbers they are actually a bigger and bigger rational numbers and they are actually working out all the rational numbers here okay, it's mind boggling it was uh, what is interesting is that this is the first known quartic convergent algorithm what it means is that newton raphson which has done post let's 1800 it is a quadratic okay this one is quadratic it takes uh, two times if you do it that's this is quartic okay it is uh, much 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 faster okay in terms of accuracy okay again uh, these things i think i must have must heard about madhava okay in kerala school of mathematics okay i sorry i don't have time it turns out that uh, even approximate for pi there was uh, algebraic uh, iteration there are if you want to summarize this it turns out to be a very slowly converging series and uh, madhava and other people they wanted to say how to make it faster and if you look at it the amazing thing that is there in yukti bhasha okay they will tell you that the way to do it is by algebraic iteration okay by systematically uh, like looking at forms and then iterating over it because it's not good enough again you get a better big, more complex form again you iterate over it and, we, uh, and then it turns out you get much 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 accurate things so i think i i know that i'm very close to uh, ending so i just will end with a few more pictures this is chand bauri this is a temple is not is it's a not temple it's a well okay this is kandare mahadev you can see the way the spires go up it is in kajuraho it's a truly amazing i don't have a, you take the picture and keep on exploring you'll see more and more deeper structure okay and this is modera temple in uh, gujarat okay hmm? and this is uh, uh, this uh, this is in karnataka the somnathpur you'll see that this particular spires they follow what is called the cocker you see you can take a geometric shape like a line and you can convert it systematically it's a rule based system you convert it into four parts one like this one like this one like this and then you take the same thing again iterate over the same each line so each, this line becomes this this line becomes this line this line becomes this line you keep on iterating over it you'll get this line and it turns out that this particular shape is essentially equivalent to this cocker okay okay this is in somnathpur is about 100 uh, 100 kilometers from bangalore okay this is the shape of you can see the structure here okay and again you'll see it very very much in other places in stambhas you'll see it in garbagudis okay garba garbagruhas okay you'll see various iteration going on okay and this you'll also see in mandapas you'll also see it in uh, shikaras also okay 
I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. And uh, these are all kuntas. Basically, these are the water structures. And uh, okay. And what is interesting is that they systematically think about it. For example, they tell you that this is eka, dvi, tri. Okay. Basically, you iterate it. You get various forms of this guy. Okay. It's not just an accidental thing. They're systematically thinking about it. Okay. This is uh, Mahabalipuram. If you see from the top, okay, you'll see various structures of this kind. Okay, so again, fractals was mentioned. This is an example of a fractal thinking. Okay. This is a uh, raga system. You'll see that all the melakartas in uh, Carnatic music, they actually have an uh, there's something called encoding scheme called Katapiyadi scheme. This includes in computer science something called naming, indexing, and lookup. All these things are involved in this one. Again, I, my apologies. I don't have time to describe what this is, but it's a beautiful artistic object. Hmm? 70 to 70 to Melkartas. You can see various, uh, rag, uh, this, uh, various types of reeds, various types of gas, etc. And then they are systematically uh, looking at all the combinations. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think I think I'll stop with this. It turns out that there were even because of all this mathematical orientation, it turns out there was a systematic, uh, some kind of understanding of binary numbers, sur surprisingly. And uh, it turns out that uh, I think in uh, Chandas, there is some notion of what is called ganas. Okay? Magana means it is, uh, yagana for example is hraswa, short syllable, and then one one is long, long symbol. Okay? So the yagana is basically short, long, long. And magana is this. So it turns out there are various types of ganas, eight of them. The question is how to remember these things. It turns out that they have an interesting formula. It's called emata raja bana salagam. Okay? And this one is what is called the the earliest known De Bruyne sequence. Basically, what it means is that if you go through like this, you'll get 0, 1, 1, then you'll get 1, 1, 1, you'll get 1, 1, 0, you'll get everything exactly once. Okay? Okay, this is a very deep, interesting idea, which uh, mathematicians in 1946, De Bruyne, he came up with this idea. And this is an interesting uh, thing because uh, even when you're doing telegraphing in olden times in 1840s, etc., right, you had to have a minimum number of circuits. And the question is, if I want to get all the telegraphic symbols, how to get it in the simplest, most, uh, let us say, least cost method? That turns out to be a De Bruyne sequence. And this uh, our ancient Indian poetic structure of people, they again, for memorization purposes, also came with the same idea. Okay. Long time back. Again, in terms of, I'm going to start, uh, my apologies, and this is the last one. Okay. It turns out that uh, in text preservation, there are various styles of chanting. Okay. Uh, and uh, Ghana, for example, is a way in which you chant something. Uh, you, for example, you take a word. For example, uh, uh, let's just take this word uh, just for, for simplicity. It will be rug, rug veda. Huh? Okay, I think you can probably. Uh, okay. So basically, it's a way in which you can do error coding so that in case some mistakes happen, they can be recovered. Okay. So there are some very interesting ideas in uh, uh, coding theory that uh, have been also employed. And that's the reason why they say that Rigveda, for example, has been preserved across Indi Indic universe for almost more than 4 million, without any change, including intonation, which is truly a mind-boggling uh, phenomenon. So I think I just have, I hope I have uh, uh, tried to throw some light on this issue. Hmm? I'm sorry? Meme. A meme, see, there's a genetic information and mimetic information. Mimetic means to, uh, s the, to mimic. Okay? Basically, from similarity, you can get a thing. See, genetic is coming through our genetic model. Suppose I see somebody doing something. Okay? Then if I copy that thing, that's mimetic. It's not genetic. Okay? So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that a computational perspective helps understand Indic tradition in many different places. And it is a deep meme in the system. It is a sort of uh, everywhere present. Okay? And uh, essentially, recursion. And creation in its many forms, composition, all these things, what mathematicians and computer scientists you know, talk about. This is a very, very common thing in our case. And uh, my belief is that until you really grasp this idea, you really can't explain the Indic thinking, okay? whether it is Jainas, whether it is Buddhists, whether it is Vedic people, because they have this deep down notion. And uh, again, it comes from Panini, I think, because Panini was the first to explicate this uh, notion that language is understandable. Even phonology, the way we speak, for example, that there is a certain, you know, murdanyas, and this, there's various ways in which you can produce sounds. And uh, that fact that you can actually phonetically describe it, that took about 2,500 years ago. If you look at International Phonetic Association, that those guys came only in the 1850s. And uh, these people are actually 
that are far ahead in terms of thinking about how to think about how, how sounds are produced, how language is produced. Okay? And this is a truly tremendous, uh, and that's because of that idea that recursion is, or iteration is a critical idea about how to structure your thinking. Okay? If you are able to do it, then you can explain a lot more things. Okay? So I think that is where I think uh, I'd like to end. I want to again thank uh, people for uh, you for a uh, patient here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, My uh, apologies for taking more time. Uh, your presentation, uh, you had to go through very fast. Actually, it is a very long presentation. You have uh, uh, covered a wide range of subjects, and actually, it is a day-long presentation, <laughs> you, which you have, you know, um, put it into a very sh short period of time. We are already 20 minutes behind the schedule, but uh, I would like to have a couple of questions uh, for discussion, please. So what do you think of this uh, genetic code and biometrics, uh, which we are doing right now mm. all over? Or, or, or whether it's the imprint of your thumb or whether it is your eyes. Uh, it seems that people like to say that there's never no chance of replication there. Is that no, correct? Okay. No, it's not true. Actually, it turns out your iris information can be a good camera. I can capture your iris information. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, does it replicate? Yeah, because, you can, you can. or is it unique? Because you call it a unique no, identification. No, it's very unique. That I'm not going to dispute. It could be unique, but as a means of authentication, it's a very suspect. Because even uh, your so uh, question I'm asking with regard to your talk is: Is it iterative in any way? Is it something, or it is not iterative? I'm not sure I can understand the question. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is the following: that our uh, if you are talking about other kind of systems, right? This ability to replicate our thumbprints or our iris things is definitely possible without my being present. Because I touch some surface, I can catch it. Now, whether this is uh, biometric is connected with replication, uh, etc., I think that comes from, for example, when the child is born, inside the mother's womb, it is sitting in a particular way. And I think that there are various, uh, let us say, uh, movements of the, you know, blood or whatever it is. They create certain new structures. So I don't think I have anything more to say. I think there's a replication. Hmm? Yes, if it can replicate itself, say none of our samskaras can be replicated. Even among the cousins, the thinking is to totally independent from the each other. So replication has its own limits. That's what I held. My apologies, I'm not sure I'll be able to answer your question. I don't, know, I don't understand enough of it. Should I answer the question? Sir, can I? Please, please. Uh, I have two very small queries. One is language of computer and one is language of human creation. So human creation created hundred thousands and thousands years back. How, how, how could you peep into the past through the language of computer one thing and how the recursion is possible and how it could be acceptable one thing. Second is as to the RAS. Ras is not ras is is expressed through three three uh, aspects. One is in the creation, literary creation, the author, the sculptor, the architect. Second is ras in the object itself, and third is ras through the observer. So how 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 will you how will you just find it? Third is. As to the explanation in the language of computer about a few images like that of Shesha Shai Vishnu and particularly Ardhanarishwar, you have not used the word also. So how do you think that you can justify yourself if you do not know the very basic concept which came in Gupta period wherein Raghavansh says Vagartha viva samprikta, vagartha pratipatte, jagata pitra vande parvati pra. This is a wonderful fusion. She, she was talking about the fusion this morning. So it, it is one of the most ancient and most wonderful example which the India has given to the world. So these points. Can I go first? Yes, please. Simple question. It's a very 
interesting way of looking at uh, ancient ideas. I have a very basic question, you know, after you've surveyed everything, I mean, am I to understand that ultimately everything is reduced to mathematics? Um, I mean, I don't know. What is the mool okay. no, of all this? I'm not saying that uh, everything is reduced to mathematics. Or, or some kind of an idea no, of uh, structure, no, number, What I'm trying to suggest is that uh, when you look at any complex system, there is some multiple levels of layering is going on. And, uh, and that layers enables you to make some sense of it. Okay? For example, even if you look at uh, uh, music, right? you have what are called swaras. And basically using the swaras, you build some other com more complicated structures. And then build on top of it, build uh, various, for example, Packard, for example, there is, there is some kind of a model. So what I'm trying to say is that computer science or mathematics gives a handle on how to take a very complex system and create certain abstractions. And then the multiple abstractions are there. We are not saying there is only one abstraction. There could be multiple abstractions. And then depending on the particular need for uh, whatever uh, purpose what we have in mind right now, different abstractions can be useful. So there is no one single description. There could be multiple descriptions, multiple levels of descriptions, and then they will be interacting in their own ways and multiple ways. And then, but as a person trying to understand it, certain ways of looking at it are helpful. For example, I look at that Seshi Shai thing. To me, it is totally flummox with me. Okay, I don't understand how to explain it. But then if I think about certain other models, possibly there is something because the unitary models or reproduction don't seem to make sense. If I look at a cell, I need to say there's something called ribosomes and there is something called DNA and the ribosome machinery is required to replicate the DNA. And then you will see that uh, uh, once I create that uh, additional DNA, they have to be separated. If I don't separate, I don't find that uh, I can reproduce because I'll get a, something wrong again. Okay? Not only do I have to replicate, but I also have to have a machine to separate things out and then put these two things under two independent trajectories. Okay? So there's all kinds of things that are going on. And the thing is, I need various submachines. And again, what I'm trying to suggest is that you cannot have a single unitary model. You need to have certain multiplicity of ideas. When they come together, they seem to have a certain uh, ability to explain things. Okay. By itself, each independently is not able to explain anything. Okay. Again, that is where I think one Neumann is talking about. He is basically, if he posits a universal construction machine, he is not going anywhere. But the minute he says, it's okay, I'm able to think of copying instructions and separating the instructions out as two separate copies. And each copy can be loaded onto a universal construction machine. Then this particular thing is now able to actually replicate itself. Okay. Just like what a cell also does. Okay. So in a sense, that, that, that I think is basically the interesting ideas that come from mathematics and computer science. Okay. Of course, this also. Yeah. Is <laughs> no, I'm not saying that that's the only way to think about it, but it is one way to un help understand yeah, the complexity yeah. of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. It is just too complicated, because when I think about a cell and all the way it does it, so many enzymes and so many things, it is mind-boggling. Okay. It is just uh, totally, uh, let us say, uh, mind-blowing, I would call it. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, so finally, we have to make sense of it. So to explain to other people, this roughly could be what could be happening. That's what thank you very much. So is there any? So I think, uh, thank you very much. Um, so this session has been very wonderful. Professor Sisi Roy's uh, very insightful presentation and uh, Professor uh, Kanchi Gobinadji's uh, very comprehensive, uh, covering a wide range of uh, areas, uh, uh, trying to look uh, into our ancient tradition through a modern perspective of uh, mathematics and uh, computation. So, and I won't uh, say anything because uh, to speak uh, uh, before lunch and particularly when it is getting late, it would not be always wise to speak at that time. So, so thank you very much for your participation and uh, for your presentations, uh, wonderful presentations. So please join for lunch. Thank you very much.